everyone, uh, back with you. And I thought that uh, since I'd been fielding quite a few questions about the refractory slurry that I used to dip my lost foam coatings in, I thought I'd do, put together a short video for you folks here um, on that. Um, the direct answer to the question is um, I use a commercial product called Polycap 600, and it's made by a company called uh, Refractory Coatings Technologies. They go by Refcotech, which I'll show you here. It's no, no secret. A little close up there. You know, that's, uh, that's Refcotech um, that you see. And Refcotech there, you see on the bucket. So uh, R-E-F-C-O-T-E-C. -E and uh, they make a number of refractory coatings. Um, this one is specifically formulated for non-ferrous lost foam casting. Um, the one thing I'll start off and tell you right a bit about before you try to contact them is, is they've got a 600 pound minimum and the 600 pound minimum is a 55 gallon drum or you can buy 10 five gallon pails and that's 600 pounds but it's 750 bucks. So there's a $750 minimum and uh, that probably puts it out of, out of reach of most obvious unless you're going to split it with uh, other enthusiasts a number of ways. For me, um, I was putting together a 30-gallon uh, vat for dip coating, which I'll get to um, at the end of this video on that. And uh, I could justify um, most of that cost just in the time savings. And I'll talk a little bit um, about that and uh, what my thoughts are on that. But um, a little bit more about the coating um, itself. So um, I use that uh, almost exclusively now. And everything that I use for pattern stock is Owens Corning um, uh, Pink um, Extruded Polystyrene. Um, I use their Formula 150 product, which is um, one of their lower density uh, um, extruded foams. It's about 1.3 pounds per cubic foot. There's 250, 350, and there are higher density foams, and I think there's even a 100. But I found this is a nice compromise between uh, strength and it machines, sands, and, and finishes well. So that's what I use for everything except spruce stock uh, and gates. And for that, um, I'll use the white beaded, uh, even lower density um, expanded polystyrene for that often, just because it's, it's scrap that I can salvage. And the lower the density uh, there, the less, less heat it takes from the melt. But um, I only mention that because um, I just, you can get an idea. This is just one dip um, in the refractory coating and you see how it's all a very uniform color and surface uh, uh, finish on that. And under there is that pink foam. So I'm getting very, very nice uniform coverage. And what uniform coverage means is, is that you have uniform permeability. And permeability of the coating is really key in lost foam because that controls the rate at which the metal consumes um, the pattern and gives you a nice controlled um, metal propagation front and really helps to keep down um, the uh, flaw population. Now there's, there's different um, ways to coat other than dipping. I mean, dipping's great because it's very, very fast. And that's the pr principal reason I'm doing. The other reason um, that I dip is, is, is the fact that you get that uniform coating inside and out. And if you've got interior features on a part like the one I'll show you before the end of the video, you'll understand why it's such a time saver besides getting um, all the uniformity and repeatability. So um, that's one part. And just to show you, you know, that's the second one I'm making. It's actually a part um, for a gantry crane. There's uh, two legs and then a vertical post for the, the crane, and that's what that piece is for. Um, that, but, uh, and there's a couple other pieces uh, that I've got here, but um, a couple of remarks um, about refractory coatings. Um, these folks, Refcotech, make other refractory coatings, namely their, their biggest uh, selling products um, are mold and core washes that they sell um, into primarily the steel and iron industry, but also non-ferrous uh, um, foundries as well. And uh, mold and, car, and core washes, uh, those coatings that are the permeable type, because there's both types, there's permeable and non-permeable mold wash. Um, on that. But the permeable mold washes will be very, very similar to these lost foam coatings. And uh, 
So if you've got a uh, professional foundry products um, supplier near you that you have a trading relationship with, you might ask them about their mold wash products. And if they've got a permeable mold wash product, it might be something you could use for lost foam. Now for me, um, I have uh, one of their local uh, branch offices being Repscotec here. So I didn't have to pay freight um, or anything. So, you know, um, those things are all pretty important when you're talking about actually getting the product to you and what the cost is for you to use it. Now, there's, um, there's lots of recipes out there for these types of coatings floating around um, on the internet. I've dabbled with some of them, and uh, um, I'm going to tell you that uh, what's in them, you can, if you're the kind that likes to experiment um, with those types of things, they're about uh, mm, a little less than half water. About most of the rest is about 40% of the rest um, is the uh, bulk material, which is usually alumina, mullite, talc, zirconia, you know, just kind of depends on what level of refractory you need. If you're doing non-ferrous, uh, talc or gypsum is, is just fine um, on that. But then the other five or 10% of what's left will be uh, um, what is generally referred to as binding um, uh, agents, um, suspending agents, and flow modifying agents. And Really, um, binding agents are usually just uh, clays like bentonite um, or sodium silicates. Um, suspending agents are things that uh, keep the solids in suspension. You don't have to have them, but if you, if you don't, they'll settle out very quickly and you'll have a hard time keeping, you'll have to mix your uh, slurry all the time and they tend to settle out and get hard in the bottom. So um, dextrin is a pretty common uh, suspending agent. It'll also increase the viscosity because um, you need to modify the, the viscosity because if that solid's loading, if it's half water, it'll just run right off the part. I mean, it won't be viscous enough to hang up on the part. So you have to have some kind of uh, uh, you know, modifying agent to make it more viscous than what it would naturally be. And then the last thing they talk about in, in that um, being uh, uh, flow modifying agents, the biggest part of that is um, surfactants. And surfactants just break the surface tension and help the, uh, the coating lay down nicely uh, uh, and uniformly and self-level on the pattern, which is important for lost foam because um, uh, polystyrene foam is very hydrophobic, meaning it repels water. Um, if you have, it's a good thing that it's not a shiny finish because I've usually sanded my patterns or cut them and machined them in some way, and that gives it a lot of surface area. So it'll, it'll hold water better than like a, the smooth unmodified um, finish. But the good news is, is if you don't want to um, buy a uh, um, commercial coating because it's impractical for you to do so in that quantity, and you don't want to experiment and make your own or try other um, professional materials, I'll tell you that um, uh, drywall joint compound, namely the lightweight non-setting variety um, works just fine. And I would say it works 90% as well um, as the professional materials for at least aluminum casting and probably um, bronzes um, as well. And I actually have a couple of threads at uh, thehomefoundry.org the that talk about um, coatings and coating with uh, lightweight non-setting drywall joint compound. It's, it's inexpensive. You can get it at any home improvement store, any of the big box stores. I personally, I use the US gypsum product. It's in a red, white, and blue container. I buy the pre-mixed stuff. You don't have to buy the pre-mixed stuff. You can buy the powder and mix it yourself because you're going to want to dilute the pre-mixed stuff anyway. But you can get a gallon pail for like 10 or 15 bucks or something. It'll last you a good long time. And the reason for the non-setting um, stuff is because you don't have to throw away what you don't use. You can just keep it in a sealed container and then reuse it indefinitely. And uh, the, uh, the other good news about that is, is I think that uh, the drywall joint compound has most of those ingredients that I was reeling off. It's, it already has, which is probably mostly talc or gypsum um, for the solids. It's, it's water-based. Um, there are alcohol-based um, coatings on that, which I don't think are safe. They're, they dry faster, but uh, not practical for me. Um, but they also probably have um, suspension agents and maybe even surfactants. But 
One thing, I'll come back to the surfactants in a minute, because one thing that I use, even with the Polycap 600, is before I dip um, my patterns, I either uh, dip them in soapy water or I spritz them down, um, depending on the shape of them, um, with the spray bottle, and then just take light air pressure and blow off the excess. And what that does is, is that it, it coats the whole pattern um, with, uh, it wets it first and already um, gets it wet, but it gets that soap on there. And I use Dawn dishwashing soap, and it's basically the active ingredient in that, that's the surfactant, is uh, propylene glycol, which is food safe stuff. It's the same stuff that is put in uh, dishwasher detergent for anti-spotting but it's a surfactant and it'll break the surface tension and it'll make your coating stick to waxes and to polystyrenes and lay down more evenly. So um, I do that. This, uh, the Polycap 600 probably already has a surfactant in it, but if I don't um, use the uh, soapy water uh, uh, rinse and, uh, first, a lot of times I still get little BBs um, that where there's little air bubbles and I never get that when I use um, the Dawn and water. You want to uh, ask how much, I mean, this is a 32 ounce bottle and I think I put something that would, like if you puddled it um, on your tabletop, it'd be no larger than a quarter. So it doesn't take very much Dawn dishwashing detergent at all to make for an effective surfactant. And if I uh, do that, you can probably see that there's, you know, a soap layer in there. So it doesn't take a whole lot, but that'll help um, a, whole, a whole lot. And uh, the other thing to remember here is a lot of people go crazy with the thickness of their coatings. You don't want a thick coating and, and it really doesn't do hardly anything to support the mold. It's not the purpose of it. The, the purpose of the coating is to give you a good surface finish, prevent the sand from embedding uh, in, in your casting, which is will really wreak havoc uh, if you machine parts on that. Uh, but the, the other primary factor is to control the rate at which gas escapes, the permeability of the coating. And a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that in lost foam coating, there really is no such thing as venting a lost foam casting because the, if properly done, the entire surface of the casting is the vent. The, uh, the evaporated polystyrene goes through the coating and the mold wall on that. So, um, I've settled it on dip coating and I'll um, see if I can tell you um, where I think they're applicable. The good news though is, depending on the nature of your pattern, if you have patterns that don't have interior features um, and all of the exterior features uh, are easy to reach and you're an infrequent caster and you only cast once every great while, what you want to do is use um, that lightweight non-setting drywall joint compound and brush it on. Now when you get it, um, obviously it's kind of a thick paste-like consistency. You just want to thin it with water just to the point where if you dipped a brush in it, it would sag on your brush and maybe just be able to form um, a very slow forming stream that runs off um, your brush. And if you thinned it to that consistency, this is an example of a piece of polystyrene. This is a pump handle off an ornamental pump and uh, it's been brush coated with, uh, with uh, that lightweight uh, um, uh, non-setting drywall joint compound. And you can see if you look close, it's got brush marks, but the brush marks really don't matter because it's really just the surface finish of the foam that matters. And this coating will replicate the surface finish of your pattern um, almost perfectly. And uh, you keep it thin enough, and when you're, when you're coating with uh, this uh, the white uh, drywall joint compound, you really only want your coating thick enough to cover and turn the foam from pink to white. If your part when it dries is white, it's thick enough. And you'll see a lot of folks on YouTube just caking on, you know, plaster and trying to get a quarter inch layer like they're shell casting. And all that does is take forever to dry and make your coating less permeable and make all of your, um, all of your uh, evaporated foam gas have to escape through your sprue because it can't get out through the walls of, uh, of the pattern. But for sure, brushing on um, a thicker, uh, thinned, lightweight drywall joint compound is the way to go um, for home hobbyists that only cast every once in a while. Now, <clears throat> if you cast more often than that, or you've got complicated shapes, like I'll show you here at the end, they have lots of interior features that you want to coat, then dip coating is, is just hard to beat. 
the good news is, is <clears throat> you can dip coat uh, with uh, that same uh, drywall joint compound. And here's a couple of pieces. And again, I've got a thread um, out on uh, the homefoundry.org um, that describes this. But all I did was add water to that lightweight, non-setting drywall joint compound and put in just a little bit of um, uh, just a spot um, or so of that uh, um, Dawn dishwashing soap, the, the propylene glycol um, as a surfactant. And these are the kind of the results I got. You can see it's a very, very uniform um, white coating. It's very similar to the Polycap 600 result that I get, only it's white. And all it is, you know, these are just uh, that pink foam, but you can see it's, it turned it white and these are just nonsense pieces. This is a ring I put on here and I put a wax fillet um, around it just because coating the wax and getting it to adhere to the wax is more challenging than it is the foam. But uh, I've cast a few parts with the, the dip coated plaster and, and, and it works great. So, um, and you could, you could buy um, enough of that drywall joint compound to fill a 30 gallon drum probably for 40 or 50 bucks. Um, especially if you buy the mix your own um, stuff on that. But before you do that, I'd encourage you to experiment with it a little yourself and find the formulation you want. And then uh, lastly is there's an in-between here is, is uh, if you have something you don't want um, or you don't have the space to store, you know, 30 gallons of, of slurry or you don't want to maintain that or hassle with it. You know, this is an automotive upright that I cast some time ago. Um, and uh, I, uh, this was before I had my dip coating rig and used Polycap 600 and I brushed the exterior of this part and then I made uh, styrofoam plugs for these and I, I plugged the interior with those styrofoam plugs, filled it up with a little bit, put plugs in here and then slushed uh, coated the inside and drained it out. So you could still, that yeah, might be a, you know, a technique that you could employ if you've got um, a casting that has some difficult to reach um, or a lot of interior parts that you want to coat, but you don't want to go to the time or the expense of um, having a vat um, of slurry around. That's kind of an in-between where you can, you can coat the exterior with a brush and you can coat the interior by kind of slush molding um, the interior and draining it. Uh, the one thing I will say about the drywall joint compound compared to the Polycap 600 is, is that it typically will take longer to dry. Um, not a lot longer, but uh, if you're somewhere that's a, a cool climate where you have heat, I always just put them underneath a box um, in my, uh, over a heater vent in my house. Um, you can set them out in, in the sun. A little breeze helps a, a lot. If you lived in the low desert, they'll dry in just a couple of hours, um, you know, outside uh, for sure. So uh, you don't have to go to the, uh, the extreme of making a drying room, but uh, if you have something, about 104 or 105 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and dry air dries them out really fast. Outside of that, it's just a matter they'll all dry in just about any climate. Warmer is better. You just um, just takes more time as well. So anyway, that's the discussion um, about uh, lost foam coatings um, on that. Um, I'm going to break away here from the coating discussion and uh, actually coat a part for you. And this will be an example. Um, of a part where you can understand the importance of, uh, of uh, dip coating. So this is a project I've been working on and it's an intake manifold, an automotive intake manifold. And there's runners and each one of these runners goes across to a carburetor flange here. And you know, the, the white foam is expanded polystyrene. It's all my, my gating. But you could see if, if I was gonna try to brush coat, you know, all of these undercuts and internal features, what a nightmare it'd be. It'd take forever, but when I, I'll show you here in my dip coating rig, it's going to literally take me about uh, uh, 45 seconds or a minute um, to, to dip coat this, and the rest of it then is just letting it dry. So all these interior features um, will be addressed in one fail swoop when I dip coat it. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'll break away here for just a minute and get my dip coating rig rolled out, and uh, we'll dip coat apart. Be with you shortly. All right, everybody, I'm back with you here. Um, got my dip coating rig set up, which just announced uh, wheeling it out. Um, and I set the arm height uh, here. 
you can't really see it being a one man show here. I don't have a good cameraman, so um, all this is is a 30 gallon barrel on a drum dolly that's full of the refractory coating, the polycap 600 we were talking about. And I've attached to it um, these uh, hanging arms that I can basically position at any height or angle um, over the bat. Because when I dip it, I'm going to hang it on here and let most of the excess um, drip off of there. But uh, the only other thing that I've done is I mentioned earlier that I uh, spritzed down my, uh, my patterns with soapy water. So I've already done that. I did that. And then the other thing that I did was I haven't used uh, my slurry for a while. So you probably see these uh, drywall paddles hanging on here. Um, I put the paddle in a drill and, and stirred up the slurry to make sure I had a nice uh, uniform mix of all that. So you don't need to do that if you use it every few days. But uh, given it's kind of an important pattern, you know, I just wanted to make sure that everything was up to snuff on that. But outside of that, um, we're ready to dip away here. So one thing I am going to do is there's a couple of wax appliques. Um, uh, here for a part number uh, and a logo, and I learned just to scrub in the uh, slurry a little bit on those. So I'm just going to throw a little bit of brush coating on them. It just helps to break the surface tension and make sure that we don't have any, uh, you know, anomalies with those. That's just something I learned over time. Usually the dip coating will do it, but this is just kind of a added layer of assurance. So anyway. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to dip this end first because the, the other end that I ultimately want to hang up. Um, the, the pattern is really buoyant, so you got to be careful because it takes a lot of force to push it down there, and I don't want to break the pattern. I'm going to go most of the way down with it, and uh, I'd say I'm pressing a good, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 pounds of force on that. So I've got that down in there, and it's in the slurry. I'm going to let that pop back up. Let most of the excess run off, and I'm going to turn it around. Take a discussion here. It gets a lot heavier when you uh, when you dip coat it. So part of the reason, um, you know, for the structure of, of the gating is it always worries me a lot, um, particularly on this end because it's not that strong. On that, I'm going to try to let a lot of this run off of there. Is the gating needs to be and the sprue needs to be strong enough to, to support the pattern, you know, when it's dipped. And uh, when most of it is run off of there, I'll show you. I've got a piece of cardboard behind here. I'll get the cardboard on it and I'll lay it down and take it off the hook on the cardboard um, and let it dry the rest of the way. It'll spend a good long time here um, on the hook, but uh, you know, probably. 80% of what's going to drip off of it is already dripped off of it on, on that. I let it hang for just a little bit to try to keep the mess down. But then the flip side here, going the other direction, if you get it off the hook, harder from this angle. There we go. But now I've got it in the uh, orientation it needs to be. And again, away from that, get it most of the way down here. Oh, up a little bit. Right there. All right. Now, now it's just hoping that. Uh, my gating system can support it, and uh, I'll tell you, it's not free from doubt. So, there we go. I'm actually going to bring, bring this down a little bit because I'm really kind of worried about the gating system. All right, so that's just a little bit more. Just out of the slurry, or planning on my part. Out of the woods there. 
So that's it. The rest of it's like watching paint dry, but we'll let it hang there for a while. And uh, maybe I'll come back and show you after it's good dry for the... All right, I'm back with you. I let it kind of drip dry for a few minutes here, but um, I'm not going to kid you. I'm kind of sweating bullets about the uh, strength of the end of the gating I've got it hanging on. I can see some deflection in it, and it's kind of an afterthought for me, but I wanted to hang it this way because there's a blind cavity that just let all the the slurry run out of that blind cavity. But um, I think I can get it off of there and just set it down on the piece of uh, plywood here. So let's see, uh, let's see how I do while loosen this up here. Um, this here, this end gets cut off later. And I've got another little wooden block down on the other end. So I can get this off of here. We're going to take it out of there. And I'm just going to set it down. There like this. So, oh, Lord's running out of there, but that's okay. We'll uh, let that work its magic there. Some spot I touched. And, you know, it'll puddle up on, on the cardboard, but it'll dry. And hopefully, uh, I got it in and out of the vat and I didn't break anything. And, uh, you know, it can drip dry the rest of the way. So, after it dries, uh, we'll have a look at it. Might be in a different thread though um, when I'm working on actually casting that thing, but you get the idea as far as the coatings go. That was a uh, that was a mother um, of a pattern, a big pattern um, to dip. It weighed about uh, three tenths of a pound um, before I dipped it, and I'm guessing it weighed about five pounds when I first pulled it out of the slurry. So you know, you think about five pounds hanging on the foam in different places, and I put little. Uh, feet um, on the bottom of the gate um, there so it sits nice and level and off the cardboard to dry so it's well supported and won't warp and after the slurry dries the pattern actually gets a lot stiffer because it's got that refractory shell you know even though it's a very thin um, layer on it the pattern's a, a lot stiffer when the uh, when the slurry dries and you, you know your your threat of breaking it through handling or something goes down quite a bit but getting it dipped and getting it handled and in and out of the slurry um, that's just something you got to pay close attention to because it's a disaster you put all that time into a pattern and then you drop it and because if you drop it when it's wet it's going to break um, it's going to do damage to it so anyway um uh, crucial periods off on that but uh, like they say the rest of it's like watching paint dry we'll rejoin you a little later bye now Hello everybody, I'm back with you. Um, after dip coating the uh, intake manifold, that's dried overnight. And it's not completely dry yet, but it's, it's dry enough that uh, most of the external features where we can handle it and take a look at it. <clears throat> um, I'm going to use this little segment of the video both uh, in the uh, video series for making this intake manifold and this uh, short series on um, dip coating lost foam patterns. So you might see it twice if you follow me and watch my videos. But um, by and large, things turned out. Um, they're going to be just fine. Um, I'd say it's about 90% dry uh, right now. A couple of things that I didn't mention um, in the dip coating uh, video is, is that it was kind of hard to manipulate the pattern after I went on and on about how great dip coating was. Between that and trying to video it and stand you know, in an unusual position so you could see it, um, I did struggle a bit with it, and uh, the biggest thing was, if I had this to do again, um, I'd make this portion uh, right here of the uh, uh, handling structure much more rigid and robust, because as I was handling it by this area, this area right here and on the other side was deflecting big time, and I was scared to death that I was going to break it and drop it, which would have been a disaster. So consequently, um, I got it off the dripping hook um, very early and, and got it sitting on these little uh, drying legs I incorporated into the gating um, because I was just, I was really starting to sweat it about, uh, you know, breaking it. But if I did that, um, it would have been, um, I could have added a couple other features because getting it off the, uh, the dripping fixture early meant that there was more excess uh, um, slurry still on the pattern. And even though um, it was you know, uh, safer to set it horizontal sooner, that caused some of the slurry to puddle down in, in these little corners right here 
um, by the bosses, and to a lesser extent um, up in up in here. Although I'd say 90% of it ran out of these uh, areas up here when it was hanging, but these were kind of natural collection areas, and and the uh, the slurry may be puddled about a, a quarter of an inch deep or so in there, and. And if I let that set, um, it would have taken a really, really long time to dry down in those cavities. And, uh, you know, obviously it, it wouldn't be very permeable at those thicknesses. So um, what I did was, is I just, after it was sitting there, I took a brush and just kind of wicked it out of there and uh, got rid of the excess on here and the same locations on, on the other side. And uh, it's fine because it was enough that it self-leveled. Um, afterwards and you know the coating thickness looks you know nice and uniform um, like it usually does on these but um, the only places that are still um, really wet are you can see where you probably can't see and I don't know that I can show you very well but these pockets down in here are still kind of dark green and you can tell they're wet they'd be they'd be wet to the touch and also um, on the bottom side you can see the, uh, the color difference there on the bottom side, namely here and up in these pockets. So, and that's because, you know, when it's sitting down like this, there's only about a one inch gap at the bottom and uh, the, the water vapor that's evaporating off the slurry makes that area very moist. So it's just not going to dry, but I probably have um, a good week uh, before um, I'm going to be ready to pour this thing. Um, it's been, I have to build a lot of other apparatus uh, to get my pour size um, up on that. But, uh, so I'm not going to worry about it because in a day or two, it'll be, everything will be bone dry no matter what position um, it's in. So that's not a worry. So I'll just let it uh, naturally dry. But um, if I wanted it to dry faster, I'd probably hang it or just set it on end like this and, and leave those sides exposed. And, Surprisingly, um, you know, the, uh, the runners, the interior of the runners, they actually, for the most part, look dry. And I thought that I might have to even set up, uh, you know, something forced air uh, to get those runners uh, uh, dried out. But it looks like they're going to dry out just fine. So there won't be any issues um, with that. So really the only thing that's um, left is uh, <clears throat> I'll attach a longer sprue. Here I'll just glue it on right before I pour and uh, obviously I don't put those on be, um, when I'm coating it because it makes the pattern so awkward to handle and it's just another fragile piece that, that uh, makes it difficult to handle and manipulate when it's wet and heavy on that. But that's quick enough. I mean I just uh, take hot glue and just stick the, the sprue onto it right before I'm ready to pour and coat the sprue separately on that. But maybe, you know, just for the coating purposes, I can give you a little close up there of the wax appliques. You can see, there you go, the part numbers and the, and the applique there. Um, they turned out nice. They should print through you know, nicely. I mean, hopefully they will. And hopefully we'll be talking about a successful uh, pour. Be sure to tune in to that intake manifold um, video if uh, you may already be watching it because I plan on using this just in a little part of that segment in addition to this coating video as well. But uh, it's more or less ready to pour now. I just got to get my game together um, on uh, the pouring apparatus to handle my A60 crucible um, with 40, 45 pounds of aluminum in it. But uh, be sure to tune into that video. I think I'm going to wrap it up here um, for the coating video because um, I detest long videos. They get more than a half an hour. I lose interest. In that and for the intake manifold video I think I'm going to wrap it up here as well uh, at least for part one that gets to the point where the pattern's ready to pour and I'll break out the rest of uh, that in this video for the intake manifold into a second part for the actual pour and hopefully uh, hopefully a successful result but um, thanks for watching sorry the audio um, is so so uh, on my videos. I bought a uh, I bought a remote wireless mic that doesn't work <laughs> so I need to buy return it and buy another one on that but uh, um, I'll try to get my video and audio game up a little bit in the future. But thanks for watching. I'll be back with you shortly on the intake manifold video and that's it for the uh, coding uh, video. Take care.